So we are live. Thank you. Great. Or Good afternoon, you. Black Health Matters family and friends out there. I'm going to give us just another second or two, or I'm sorry, 30 seconds to get more people in the, in the um, room here. Um, I see the numbers are going up, so I don't want you to miss any part of this presentation. So we'll just give a few more seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Um, and uh, this is going to be a great uh, session that we'll have on endometrial cancer. The session is sponsored by ESI. Um, but before I start, actually, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Retrofin and Vertex, who just completed a very informative discussion on FSGS and kidney disease. Um, to all those who tuned in, uh, it was a great session. What we'd like to do also is invite you to the exhibit hall or the chat room. And also, you can certainly click on their banners, uh, Vertex and Retrofin in the lobby, and learn more about kidney disease and FSGS. Um, so just want to make sure that you're, you stay informed. We also um, want to remind you that uh, we have an exhibit hall here that has a host of exhibitors, including our sponsor for this event, ESI. Um, they have an exhibit there with uh, in additional information on endometrial cancer and, and other areas. You can certainly go in and download um, information from their exhibit booth. And also, please stop by the network and chatting room. You can chat with your colleagues, your friends. You can meet new friends, actually, and hear from patients and advocates alike. OK. Oh, our numbers have really grown. So um, I'm going to give us another second or so. I still see people logging in. OK. All right. Well, we're ready to start. So. Thanks again for FSGS um, and kidney disease session with Retropin and Vertex, our sponsors. Thank you for bringing us that. And we're now ready to begin our discussion around endometrial cancer. And our sponsor is our friends Esai. So a um, little background on it, uh, endometrial cancer. While it's really more common in white women, black women often present with more advanced stage tumors and often harbor more aggressive histologic subtypes. Black women are also more likely to die from endometrial cancer compared to white women. And black patients have an 80% higher mortality rate, one of the greatest disparities seen among common solid tum tumors. So for today's discussion, we have right here, Dr. Ebony Hoskins smiling at you. She's a board certified gynecologic oncologist from MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Dr. Hoskins received her medical degree from Wayne State University School of Medicine in her home state of Michigan. She then gained excellent clinical skills during her obstetrics and gynecolo gynecology residency at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, where her training prepared her for a clinical fellowship in gynecologic oncology at McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dr. Hoskins has practiced gynecologic oncology for nine years, during which time she has carefully refined her medical and surgical skills. When not in the hospital, Dr. Hoskins enjoys spending time with her family, photography, and traveling. And she's also, I just learned, a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hoskins. And I will pass the virtual mic on to you. And just so that you know, okay. we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. So I'll come back in at that point. Thanks so much. Thank you for uh, the invitation and the great introduction. So we'll get started. I'm going to share my screen and um, get started with the presentation. So today uh, we'll talk more about endometrial cancer. And uh, the title of this talk is Learning the Facts of an Unequal Disease. And as Ms. Leslie just um, alluded to, is endometrial cancer 
is a very common disease. It's more common among white women as opposed to black women, but black women um, have more aggressive cancers, um, later stage in diagnosis, and um, a higher mortality rate. So we'll go through a little bit of that, but I really want to give a, um, some introduction to what I do and what the disease is and uh, maybe some more information that you will learn today. So um, as she mentioned, I'm a gynecologic oncologist and that's a doctor who specializes in taking care of women with cancers, particularly ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, vaginal cancer, uh, vulva cancer, and then of course endometrial and uterine cancer. So we'll get into a little bit more detail. Objectives for today, we'll talk about what is endometrial cancer, why do we care about it, uh, some epidemiology or the statistics in the United States, risk factors for endometrial cancer development, uh, risk, I'm sorry, uh, review some of the signs and symptoms, what uh, a medical evaluation uh, is involved with endometrial cancer, some of the, t uh, the surgery and treatment, and then briefly review some of the disparities among um, African-American women. So what is endometrial cancer? So uh, the endometrium is actually the lining of the uterus. So it's a type of uterine cancer. So when we speak of uterine cancers, there's actually two types. One is endometrial cancer and the other is sarcoma. So basically a, a cancer in the muscle or the outside of the uterus. This talk was specifically go over endometrial cancer. So cancer of the lining of the uterus. Why do we care? Well, the interesting thing, and I think it's uh, interesting, is this cancer is actually on the rise. Um, from the time I started my training in gynecologic oncology, uh, the rate per year, number of cases, new cases per year was about 40,000. And this year alone is anticipated to be 65,000. So we should be on a trajectory down as opposed to up. And the reason we care is because the, we have an obesity crisis. And so I think that is very, uh, important to know how we can prevent endometrial cancer and uh, reducing risks with uh, decreasing weight or BMI is key. So what is considered overweight or obese? Uh, and this is a, what we as physicians or uh, medical providers look at is a body mass index. And what that means is looking at weight over how tall you are. And that weight has to be over kilograms, over meters squared. So um, usually when you'll go into the doctor's office, they'll weigh you and it'll be in kilograms and they, weigh, and they measure you in height uh, with meter per meter square. And you may not recognize it, but they will calculate the BMI. So that's one of the measurements that your provider may provide you with. The, the risk increases after you get overweight. Um, so you see overweight, uh, which is really kind of over a BMI of 30 and beyond is a high BMI and high risk. So increased BMI is associated with health risk. Um, one is heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, which is basically uh, increased cholesterol, gallstones, sleep apnea, and cancer. Uh, so these are reasons why it's very important to keep a healthy BMI, not just for like having high blood pressure and high, you know, stroke, but cancer is also a risk. Uh, and one of the cancers, there are many cancers that increase risk, but I'll name them. One that's most notable is breast cancer. So you may hear some women say they've had breast cancer and it may be what they call estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive. Um, other cancers are colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer. These are all that can be related to uh, increase in weight. In endometrial cancer, the reason, again, going back to the earlier slide, while we're in a crisis, is because the obesity is increased, thus the risk factors for endometrial cancer increase. And I'll explain that later, but uh, other risk factors for endometrial cancer besides weight are unopposed estrogen. So that means, what that means is that your body is seeing estrogen uh, without having progesterone, right? So like at a, having a, a, an early age of uh, having a menstrual cycle, say someone with a menstrual cycle of the age of nine, as opposed to the average age of 12, having a late menopause, so greater than the age of 55. Um, maybe it was like 20, 20 or 30 years ago where doctors would give 
postmenopausal women, estrogen only without progesterone, those are risk factors for endometrial cancer. Also women who've never been pregnant or who have irregular cycles. Risk factors, uh, tamoxifen, so women who've had uh, breast cancer and who are uh, taking medications that are supposed to block estrogen receptor. Well, that drug tamoxifen blocks estrogen receptor in the breast, but basically uh, promotes estrogen receptor in within the uterus or the endometrium. And then of course, we already said it, I'm gonna beat this in, obesity. That is a, the, one of the biggest risk factors and the one that I see the most in our practice. Oh, another one, Lynch syndrome. So uh, families that have a history of colon cancer, uterine cancer, those are families that are higher risk for endometrial cancer. But I really wanted to take home things that we can control, if you will, is our lifestyle in regards to what we eat and activity and exercise is weight. So some brief statistics. Why, again, I, I kind of introduced this before, is that the estimated amount of um, new cases in 2020, sorry, uh, is 65,000. 620 with approximately 12,590 deaths. Um, so before I get to the next slide, it doesn't seem like a whole lot when you say, oh, 65,000 when you uh, look at the entire United States and the population of women. Um, but the part that makes it very, uh, why it is important, particularly for our, our community, is if this is a um, a graph looking at the mortality rate. So when we say mortality rate, we're talking death. We're not talking just disease, we're talking death. So when you look at whites, Hispanic, Asian American, and uh, American Indian, black women's uh, rate for death with endometrial cancer is nearly two times greater. And so um, that makes it a big deal. And especially in our community, I think it makes it a big deal because we need to have a better understanding of why. We also need to understand what the disease is. And so that's kind of my point is, is to kind of go over this. And hopefully if you guys have any questions at all, at the end of this, we'll have plenty of time to go over. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. So um, there's a, a doctor, um, uh, African-American gynecologic oncologist that is out of Washington State. And she's been looking at endometrial cancer in, in Black women, basically in the United States, in trying to, to understand why is there such a disparity in uh, the type of um, the mortality rate um, and why women are diagnosed with later stage disease and more aggressive cancers. And what she did is she uh, did her own research where she interviewed women who had endometrial cancer. And she uh, basically had a survey for them to complete and just try to understand and tease out why. And she interviewed about 19 women, and she had a couple of themes that came that kept coming up during her uh, interviews. One is that uh, there was the overall a knowledge gap with these women who were diagnosed with endometrial cancer. Uh, one was that some did not know what was considered normal or abnormal menopause. Um, misinterpretation of bleeding symptoms. I've seen patients who come in at the age of 65 that said, oh, my period just started, or I've been having a period for a year, which is um, a concern. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, this non-disclosure of symptoms until it worsens. So it may be a, a situation where we see a woman who is postmenopausal, who um, is having bleeding symptoms, but she hasn't shared it with any family, friends, or her medical provider. And then other factors is systemic, right? So we've been talking about systemic racism. And I don't know if it's, you know, I can't count that that's what the issue is. But if um, what they found is some women, when they reported that they were having bleeding, particularly postmenopausal bleeding, that their healthcare providers um, gave vague responses. So they didn't act upon what was going on. And then the shock and surprise of the diagnosis which leads to um, basically the medical provider not giving and explaining to the patients what the risks are with abnormal bleeding or menopausal bleeding. So again, our, our goal today is to try to fill in the gap, if you will, 
about um, the disease and what's considered normal and abnormal. So I, I just wanted to get very briefly, what is menopause? Going back to Dr. Dahl's um, uh, interview, what is menopause? And really menopause is a, a, a woman having no cycle for, for 12 months after having menses. Sometimes uh, that could occur in a younger woman and say age 39, uh, and, but typically the age is between 45 and 55 years old. And this, what happens is there's a decrease in estrogen and progesterone production from the ovaries. Um, and so menopause is technically when a woman has had no period for a year. And the reason that's important is because we consider um, what's considered postmenopausal bleeding, which we'll talk about. We kind of have to define that before we go on. So a woman can also be in menopause if she had surgery. So let's say ovaries were removed uh, for a cyst or something in the past that can put someone in a quote surgical menopause, but both ovaries need to be removed. So symptoms. So I would say the number one symptom of endometrial cancer is bleeding. So let me go back. We do not have a screening test. Breast cancer has a mammogram. That's a screening test. Colon cancer has a screening. That's a colonoscopy. Pa uh, cervical cancer has a screening test and that's a PAP test or HPV test. Endometrial cancer and a lot of other cancers do not have screening tests. And uh, I think some of the thought behind that is, well, most women are diagnosed with early stage disease and they typically have bleeding. And so the, you know, they'll be fine. Well, not in our population of, of, uh, of women, that doesn't necessarily happen. So I think it's important to know postmenopausal bleeding that means a woman, like I said before, has had no bleeding for a year or greater than a year. And somewhere after that, she experiences any bleeding. And we count bleeding red, pink, brown, little spot, big spot, blood clots. All of that is considered abnormal. That should be discussed with your provider, whether it's your gynecologist or your primary care provider. Now, again, I, I mentioned postmenopausal women. What about women who are not postmenopausal? Well, yes, uh, we call that premenopausal. Women can also have endometrial cancer as well, and they typically present with abnormal uterine bleeding. So maybe very heavy menses, uh, menses that we don't have like a, a regular cycle to. These should still be evaluated. One of my points you can't see there is an abnormal Pap smear. So when I say abnormal Pap smear, I'm not talking necessarily uh, with the cervix, but Maybe your doctor says we see endometrial cells on a pap smear. That's something we should not see. Um, or they see what they call glandular cells on a pap smear. These are abnormal. And then I think uh, another thing, I've seen it not too much, but if um, uh, there's any incidental findings on pelvic ultrasound. So like maybe there's an ultrasound for uh, evaluation of an ovarian cyst or CAT scan for something else, they may see something on the CAT scan or those images that need to prompt care. But really the symptoms, the number one I wanna put in your head is bleeding, bleeding, spotting, uh, particularly in postmenopausal women is concerning. So we're, we're going over this today so that you can have some knowledge and that you can have some uh, tools to know what that you're, you know, these, exists, or maybe it's not you, maybe it's a family member that you're aware of. And one thing we, um, again, we said, if it's any abnormal bleeding, talk to your provider. So if you see your gynecologist or a primary care provider, the first thing they'll do is, is get a history. How long has it been going on? How heavy? Do you have pain? Uh, is there, are there any other symptoms related to it? And uh, so that's what the history form is for. And uh, then the next they may do an imaging. So typically the things I think of is having a, you're talking to your doctor, obtaining a ultrasound. So an ultrasound usually is transvaginal where the probe actually goes in the vagina and looks at the uterus and the lining. They typically look at the ovaries of the fallopian tube. And what we're looking at is the lining to see how thick it is, if you will. Um, I would say any woman coming in with bleeding, I'm going to be a little skewed. I'm going to probably biopsy, uh, just to make sure there's nothing going on. 
And so that's the next picture there is demonstrating the endometrial biopsy, or sometimes we do a procedure called DNC hysteroscopy. And that's a surgical procedure where we dilate the cervix up, look in with a camera, and then um, take uh, any samples that we need of the lining. Uh, so let's say someone is diagnosed with um, uh, endometrial cancer. Our primary mode of treatment is surgery. So that means surgery, 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 hysterectomy, removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes, and the lymph nodes. That is how we quote stage. So you may hear some people in other diseases say, hey, we got a PET scan or we had a CAT scan. That's how the doctor knew if there was any disease spread. For this particular cancer, we don't use those tools. They help us but that's not how we stage. We stage by looking and removing the tissue and then seeing if there's any spread. So I always tell my patients that we are looking for any microscopic evidence of disease outside of the uterus. So if there's anything in the lymph nodes, uh, anything in the ovaries or fallopian tubes, that's taken into consideration. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on the surgical approach. Um, we've come so far in our, in our specialty of gynecologic oncology, where we would do uh, bigger incisions that's up and down. I remember in my training, um, I guess now it's been nearly 10 years ago, we would have these big incisions on our patients and they'd be in the hospital five days, sometimes longer. And then probably over the past 14 years, we've um, been using a minimally invasive approach called robotics. So I use, I probably say 80 to 85% of my patients will do robotic surgery. It depends if that patient's a candidate where we have small incisions on the abdomen and uh, we do it with a robot. So this is basically one of the instruments that we attach uh, to um, uh, the patient. You can't see all of the instruments and then I operate from this console. Patients go home the same day, same day or the next day and recovery time's less less bleeding, less blood loss, and it's state of the art. Um, and uh, I don't have all the data about it, but what we do find is uh, also African-American women are not offered these uh, innovative uh, te techniques and tools that, um, that are around as much. It's, it's some data about that, but beyond the scope of this talk. I wanna get through a couple of my slides. We'll skip that one. Well, we'll go back. Um, so you guys have a, enough time for questions. Uh, endometrial cancer, we, again, these are staging. It just tells you what we look at to determine the stage. So anything that's kind of outside of the uterus, particularly in the abdomen, is considered stage four. I will tell you there are countless times where I go in, in particular in my patient population, I would say I probably see about 85% Black women uh, coming in with endometrial cancer. And I'm expecting it to be low stage, low grade, and it's, um, you know, time and time again that they have advanced disease and I just don't, I don't understand. So I think we need to do a little bit more, but we'll talk about that. Uh, again, depends on the stage and what we call the grade. So that means like what the cells look like under the microscope. Do they look kind of more like nor normal endometrium, something we call grade one, or does it look more uh, aggressive or less like the normal endometrium? Those are usually grade two to three. So we take a number of things into consideration on whether there's um, a need for any further treatment. Uh, so uh, the categories I put them in are observation, meaning we don't need any further treatment. Sometimes we need to do radiation. Sometimes we do chemotherapy. Sometimes we do radiation and chemotherapy. There's a slew of um, things, and these are all kind of based off of data that help guide our care. Uh, we also use um, national guidelines to help guide the care of our patients. And that's, I think, very important when we're thinking about African-American women, Black women in this country, that not only are we provided the best care, but that we're provided a standard of care, meaning standard care that uh, a patient on the West Coast has gotten it here or whatever that we are provided that, not just kind of what some doctor wants to do. Um, just to very briefly, this one, Black women endometrial cancer, we talked about this, five-year mortality rate among Black women is 39%, whereas white women is 20%. Black women are more likely to be diagnosed in late stage. Black women are more likely to be diagnosed in high grade. And there's a lot of um, more work to do. And I think 
Um, you see uh, doctors such as Kimmy Dahl. She's one of kind of uh, one of the premier um, gynecologic oncologists doing a lot of research in this area. But a lot of research needs to be done, and it's it's really kind of all about who has the interest in it. And I think uh, sometimes it's kind of our own that may have the best interest uh, in mind. And so, anyway, the last one is kind of what one of the take homes I would like for you guys to to take home. Uh, one, maintain a healthy BMI, um, open dialogue with family and friends and medical providers about abnormal symptoms, advocate for your health. So that means going in with some knowledge base and, and not that you have to challenge your doctor, but, but that you're knowledgeable about what's going on and that you've had a chance to read. Read on a diagnosis. It's okay to question uh, what's going on. And then the, I know this is kind of a controversial thing, but I think it's so important, is that if the opportunity is given, whether it's this disease or any other, consider enrollment in clinical trials so that we can learn and treat better. So um, there are companies that are out that are having um, newer drugs, that's great, and it's, it's, it's actually progressing our field. But when I look at the number and the percentage of Black women that are participating is significantly less than the white women, but we're the ones that are more likely to die. So I think that it's, it's essential that we are uh, considering clinical trials. Uh, we need to be enrolled in them so that we can learn more. And any questions? I think we have maybe five minutes or so for questions. Yes, and thank you. Thanks thank so you. much, thanks Dr. Dr. Hoskins. This was so informative. And thanks to our sponsor, Esai. Yes, we do have some questions in here. Awesome. Let me um, get started. I hope I can answer. Pardon me? I said, I hope I can answer. Oh, I'm sure you can. Um, okay. And this is an interesting question. Uh, the question is, how long does menopause last? So menopause is, is technically, a, I guess, a year, right? So the menopause is um, the one year where you've had no bleeding. But then, so uh, I, I guess the question may be like, how long are there symptoms of menopause? Like, Right. Maybe hot flushes. I, I hear that some people have them throughout and some uh, there are several years, like two or three years or so with the symptoms. Right. Okay. And then here's another question. Is HPV associated with endo cancer? So that's a good question. HPV is associated with cervical cancer. So it, the answer is no, it is not. So HPV is human papillomavirus. It is a virus that is screened at the time typically of pap smears, it causes 99% of cervical cancer. 99%, meaning okay. HPV causes cervical cancer. And so it's important to, um, I won't go into huge detail, but anyway, important to screen for it. Right, okay. And here's another question. Um, the person's 49 and had a partial hysterectomy two years ago. So they had two years of no period. So they're asking if um, they're, now, they're now in menopause and should be concerned if some of the symptoms you mentioned show up. Should they be concerned? Well, this is what I would say. I don't know. So in our terminology, when we, we don't use the word partial hysterectomy because I don't know what that means. That means, if you say hysterectomy, that means the uterus is out. Mm -hmm. So that would be a hysterectomy. If we say both ovaries and fallopian tubes out, that's something we call bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. So if the uterus is out, the risk for endometrial cancer is none. There's no endometrial cancer. Right. Okay. And then here's one. Um, I'm generally a healthy woman. What kinds of checkup or tests should I be getting to be sure that I am cancer-free? Uh, so I think having... Um, normal um, screening tests that we have. So we don't have anything to like screen for all the cancers, but the ones that we do have, so making sure that your mammograms are caught up, pap smears are caught up, colonoscopy. Um, if there is any genetic predisposition for any cancers, um, or if there's a genetic cause, that's something that we're gonna be talking about more in the future, 
then just making sure that that's being monitored. But I think the biggest thing I find for health is weight. Seriously, food and exercise, that's, that's big. Okay, and I have another question here. If a woman has had breast cancer, are they at higher risk for endometrial cancer? Uh, I don't have a, a, there's no clear link like, okay, if you have breast cancer, now you're gonna have endometrial cancer, but it does go back to my initial discussion. Are there risk factors such as weight, increased BMI? So if that same woman has a higher BMI or weight, then yes, she is at risk for having endometrial cancer. But just because she has breast cancer doesn't mean she's at, you, do you understand what I mean? It's, it's um, they're not necessarily related, but the risk factors may be the same. Okay, and then I have another one here. Are fibroids associated with endo cancer? No, fibroids are benign, uh, ov uh, benign uterine tumors. So they are benign and they're not associated with endometrial cancer. Okay, and here's an interesting question as well. How should I prepare for my annual women's exam in order to make the best use of the time with my physician? I think making sure during out the year, if there's any concerns that come up um, or symptoms. So let's say for example, hey, I noticed a, a pink discharge last month that may need to be discussed before your annual visit. Um, and making sure you have caught up with anything that the doctor prescribed at the previous. So whether that's your mammogram, colonoscopy, weight loss, talking to a dietitian, is making sure that those things have been done. I think those are um, important, especially if you have a primary care provider that you trust. And I guess um, another related question was how often should women go in and get their um, PAP and other exams? Well, the pap smear is very different. So I don't, uh, over the past probably 10 years, we've come a long way. It used to be that we, pap smears were advised every year. Uh, but as we learn, as we mentioned earlier, HPV is the biggest driving factor for development of say cervical cancer. So um, now we don't do pap smears as often. If someone has, is negative for HPV or human papillomavirus, now the um, data supports having pap smear and HPV testing every three to five years. If there's a presence of HPV, then they'll continue to do annually. So we go all by like risk factors and the presence of HPV. That's the biggest risk. And again, we're talking related to cervical cancer. Okay, great. So we're actually out of time at this point. And I know there's a few more questions here. So I don't know, maybe you could uh, join Dr. Hoskins in the chat room for a few minutes if you care to. Okay, can actually, I'll go there. Yeah, take, yeah, she'll take a few questions. Thank you, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> okay, but I wanna I can go there. thank everyone for joining us for this session and be sure to visit the exhibit hall, get your leaderboard points, visit ESI and all of our other sponsors there, enter, go into the networking room and continue to watch our sessions. Additionally, this session as well as others will be available beginning Monday. All you have to do is register and you can watch it for 30 days. You'll be able to watch this session as well as all of our others. And please share with others that weren't able to make it today. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Hoskins. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See you in the chat room. Bye-bye. Yeah.